All right, so start now. Okay, great. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, today, um, we are in collaboration with the NUS Hackers. Uh, I am Brandon, a year four computer engineering student uh, who, is, who was the vice president of the NUS Games Development Group. I've taught Godot for four years, nearly four years is more than my first. Uh, in my first introduction to Godot, I was a year one student, just like many of you. In fresh, uh, as a freshman in 2021, learning Godot for the first time. My senior introduced me to this free and open source game engine. And ever since I've been teaching that uh, every year. 2021, I taught the game, uh, Global Game Jam, um, a beginner workshop for Godot. 2022, I taught, I taught the NUS GDG, Godot, beginner workshop for Game Start. In 2023, I taught the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department, uh, beginner workshop as well. And here to this year, I am teaching all of you from NUS Hackers, the Godot game engine. So I'm really glad and honored to have uh, you all here today. This will be probably my last time uh, introducing Godot to a big audience like you. So uh, I'd like to first start off by saying, uh, what is Godot? Right, so here we are in NUS Hackers. We appreciate the hacker culture. We appreciate free and open source software because it is made by the community. It is research being done to push the boundaries, to push the frontiers of technical innovation. Here, Godot is the largest and the third most popular game engine out there, um, following Unity and Unreal Engine. Actually, it could be the second, the second most popular game engine out there. Uh, the other two are actually uh, Godot, uh, Unity, and Unreal. So first, I'd like to give a very brief introduction on what is Godot. So of course, Godot is the free and open source game engine. It's the largest one. There are probably others out there. Probably if you use Pi Game or Scratch, if you like to, you can make a video game with that as well. Um, and I'll teach you how to install Godot. At the end of this um, workshop, I'll be able to teach you how to make a game like this if I copy this now. Lagging. Okay. I'll be able to teach you how to make a game like this. So this is the game that we'll be making. It is a very simple game whereby your character cannot you know, stop moving. And you control the character's movement by mouse. Run a bunch of random airplanes will actually uh, spawn from the sides and you will attempt to shoot you. So let's try and make a, a story out of the game. Uh, about story as well. So you are a you know supply airship trying to maintain the you know supply route between these two cities, and you are going to try to intercept enemy aircraft. Uh, once you take enough hits, you will actually die. So, and unfortunately, our uh, my sound is not loud enough to actually play that, but yeah, this is from that so, so yeah, that's the game we're going to be making today. Seems very simple, isn't it? Uh, unfortunately, I would love to have made some uh, user interface, you know, using notice, you don't actually see your health bar, you don't actually see the damage you're doing. So all of that will be done in like advanced missions because I only have two hours. So I'm going to try as my best to actually show you how to get started with game engine. So this is the game engine essentials with Godot. And Oh, yes, my, my client is like, okay. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, using how, learning how to use Godot and how to actually know what makes sense and how is it different from like Unreal and Unity. And maybe that will allow you to make uh, the best game for your Orbital project or perhaps in the future when you actually think about different types of options you have for making AR games, like me right now when I'm doing my capstone for computer engineering. So uh, some of the differences between uh, Unity and Unreal. So of course, both of them are free. All three of them are free. Um, the source code is closed for both Unity and Unreal. So Unreal has opened its source code to everyone, but it's real only. It is, the compile speed in for Godot is extremely fast. So uh, if you had guys that followed the instructions, uh, you would have installed the Godot 4.3. And you realize how fast the download speed is actually, actually is. Now, compared to Unreal, uh, Unity, you have to get an account. You have to install the Unity Hub. You have to go online and go on the Unity Hub and install that specific version of Unity, like 2022. And you have to like fill up your entire computer hard drive with two gigabytes of that entire game engine. And if you look at if you look at the download file for Godot that you have 4.3, it 
you notice that it's only like about 600, 600 megabytes for an entire game engine. And it's just one executable file. And it runs the whole game engine. No accounts and also no bloat. You also notice that the, you know, the program size is, uh, the memory usage is quite light. It is one of the lightest game engines is able to be compiled for the web, for mobile games, as well as for own computer. If I told you guys to, if I hosted an Unreal Engine uh, <laughs> workshop today, half of you would not be able to run the game engine because the hardware limitations are too high. Um, for 3D development, however, Godot does have its drawbacks. 3D, de uh, 3D development, game development is quite um, limited. Um, you know, of course, the community is working hard at it. But of course, if you would like to say that you know, 3D development uh, is something that you need to do, then I would say a real NUNT would be for you. You also uh, notice that there's a much more free assets online for the Unity store and also the Unreal Engine, with, especially for 3D assets. So you also want, want to consider Unity and Unreal for that as well. But one thing for sure is that with the power of open source, you will have a community that is always supportive of you. So you can always look up your questions. There will probably always be someone who is willing and kind enough to help you. So that's uh, all I need to sh uh, share with you today. I have some, of course, with a large community comes with a lot of good resources. And these were some tutorials that I learned while growing up, while, <laughs> while learning the Godot game engine. So you would like to refer to these, for example. Um, but for now, let's get started because I am on a speed run. And you also notice <laughs> that in the Godot game engine, in the project setting. So let's uh, do this all from scratch. So you open up your Godot game engine and go to like this. Now, uh, of course, uh, yours might be empty if you're the first timer, and you know all your projects will be here. So what you want to do actually would be you want to import the game. I know it's a bit small here, but you know you search up the directory. Uh, if you went to my GitHub, uh, you will notice that uh, you can download the zip file. So for those who are not um, familiar with Git or GitHub, you can just download the zip file. So everyone has that file. Everyone has the workshop files. Any issues you guys have, you may raise your hands and we can come and assist you. Just download the repository from the GitHub and you can import the files just by clicking on the project.codo file. Alright, everyone's got it. Okay, fantastic. So if that's the case, then I can go straight to, to actually opening up the project. So when you open up the project, this is actually what it looks like. Um, this is small. I think it's good. Yeah, so this is the uh, Godot editor. I used to have a handbook uh, I gave up to participants to actually um, participate in the video. It's just small. Let me try to increase the editing size. And see if it starts. Yeah, so I uh, give out a handbook and actually tell you what's the different types of elements within the editor. With every editor, it's a tool for you to use. And of course, with each tool, you'll be able to see what is something that you like and what is not something you don't like. So something you open, uh, when you open your project, it will look like something like this. Uh, ignore this script. I then, I just want to test out the scale of things. So let me close this. So what you notice is that when you first open it up, you will actually be in the 3D port. I uh, just want to show you off. Like, you know, you can do 3D development, very cool access. You can actually do like AR development or 3D, 3D game engine development with this. So specifically, what you want to do first is that with every uh, you know, programming language, what is the first file that you create? What do you name it as? Like, you want to type hello world. What is that file, for example? Do you have an idea? Starts with M. Very generic name. Let's say I want to create a Java file. Like, what's that called? Dot something dot Java. What is that file name called? Yeah. For example, do you, you know you know what the name called the file name? Yeah, main. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, name. A main. So exactly. So the first scene we'll actually create is the main file. Now, uh, yeah. Uh, no, no, don't create it. But, um, so sorry. Can you uh, yeah, we have a GitHub on the um. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you double click on the project.godo file within that folder. 
Okay, so um, what you want to do actually first is actually go to the 2D scene, and this is where you'll be working. Since this is a 2D game, you want to actually make a 2D uh, scene. So, but first, a main uh, node will actually be a generic node. Now, you notice that when you open up the node file, you will have a bunch of nodes. These are all the nodes of Godo. So what is a node? A well, node is basically like a class. If you have done object-oriented programming, this will be perhaps your gateway to it. In, I would like to always like to say that in software engineering, I think I feel like the easiest way to or the hardest way form of software engineering is game development. And specifically, I think that you know when you want to start programming, game development is always the easiest way to get started because it is a visual way of representing the code that you're writing. And so you know it's the most fun. So for beginners, I think that it's the best way to get started. So first you want to create a node. So just double click on the first node. This is a base class for everything. So it's literally just empty, it's nothing. What the rest of these actually means is that they're gonna inherit this base node and they're gonna add some more extraditional functionalities. So just to explore a little more, you have 2D, you have like bones, you have cameras, you have um, lines, paths, polygons, all that representing 2D development. And if you have 3D, you will have like mesh objects, materials, um, AR, XR, cameras, and all that kind of stuff. So what I just want you to do at first is actually to just click on the normal node. And what you notice is that first you have a gray node over here. Now, here's a uh, thing. You In every project, like let's say you've done a Blender tutorial, for example, you want to rename all your files to keep your project clean and neat. So you can press F2 and rename it as main. Or you can actually just right click and rename. Or you can just click and then click again. And then you rename it as well. So those three are for rename. So in the main scene, so what you're calling this right now is called the main scene. And in the main scene, it will contain the main script. Right? So what the main scene is actually about is actually uh, basically anything you want in that viewport, you can actually add it as a child. So Godot is very, is a hierarchical kind of structure. Everything is in the hierarchy. When you run the game, the first thing that runs is your main file. And everything else that gets instantiated under it are children of that main node. So what you want to do first is actually, um, yeah, so this is the main scene. And you want to control S and save that file as a file, as a scene. So the uh, suffix, for the scene or Godot scenes are called TSCNs. And you want to name it as main. And right. Um okay. Sorry, uh can you move the main TSCN to the under the scenes folder? Yeah, so just move it under there. Honestly it doesn't matter, but um just for organization's sake. Okay, so the first thing you want to do in the game is to create a player. That is where you interact with the game. And so we'll actually create another scene. This time it will be different. So let's create a, let's create a other node again. And let's create a character 2D, character body 2D. So you just type character body and it will show up in search results. So the character body 2D is basically the node that allows you to interact with it will help you in understanding movement, uh, how we can help you to map the key controls to uh, the way the character moves and interacts with the world. So unlike, you know, if you ever program in like HTML or JavaScript, you would have to manually cause the thing to move pixel by pixel by pixel in every single frame. So that's very annoying. So instead, what we want to do is that we want to just use this node and help the app game engine to help us. So once you have created this node, you want to rename it similarly and call it P-L-A-Y-E-R, player, right? So the player, the player scene or uh, the player node will be where your character is. Now, so the pl player, yeah. Similarly, you want to um, actually save the player, but okay. yeah, first, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, the player will be uh, airplane first. Oh. Yeah. So okay. Now let's add some functionalities to the player. So to actually un uh, 
control the player, you will need to do some programming. So the way Godot Go -Go works is by using something called the GD script programming language. It's a DSL, a domain specific language, which means that much like HTML, CSS, and SQL, they are all languages specific to only a single tool. So here we would like to create a script. So notice this button over here. This um what should I do? Zoom button, of course. Oh yeah. Um hold on. Let me do some settings first for the to help you understand or help you see better. Yeah, so I'll create a script by pressing this button over here. And just call this script player.gd. Okay, just leave it as default settings and click create. Oh. There it is. Ah, okay, yeah. yeah, so this is the default script uh, that you will see when you create a script specifically for the player node, uh, player ca uh, character node 3D or 2D. So uh, while you guys read it, let me uh, set up uh, some of my magnifiers and things to help you guys see better. see it better, the amount of keys I'm pressing. So, I'll leave it again. Yes, question? Ah, so, right here. So here is the script, and you, once you select this, you can actually have a button that shows here a green to attach script. So attach script will actually uh, allow you to add functionality to that node. So once you have, uh, it will open up the script uh, viewport over here. And it will give you a basic rundown of the scripts here. So what is actually happening here is that increase the motion sickness. Okay. So what actually is happening here is all these functionalities that are giving you is actually for gravity for platformers. So we're not playing a platformer. A platformer has gravity, and this script is trying to implement gravity. We're not actually playing a platformer. Instead, we are actually you know moving the icon around the map. Doesn't have gravity. It's just following your mouse. So. What we want to do is we want to get rid of everything right here. All right. So what we're doing right now is to actually make everything by ourselves. The, the first thing you want to do is actually to create the way that your icon can actually follow you. So first thing you want to do in every single game engine, the two things will be common inside every script. There will be the ready function as well as the physics process function. So specifically, right now, we're going to use the physics process function. And so you type in func, which means the function, and underscore, which denotes a engine-specific language uh, function, physics underscore process. So what this means is that this function is going to run every single frame. In other words, in a game with 60 FPS, is going to run 60 times per second. And so this script will actually determine the way that you actually you know, run the, the way that your, your character will move. So specifically, we want to get a direction vector. So we'll type direction vector. And this direction vector will be a 2D vector that will determine the global mouse position or where you are actually facing to actually get the mouse position. Now you're complaining that this isn't actually a variable. So unlike in Python, this one requires you to say that what is a variable. So you have to type above here, variable, direction, vector. Boulder isn't a type, um, type defined script. It's not typed. 
in, in defining the type of the variable. However, it does support it just like Python does. So in Python, you can you can put a colon and you can put what kind of type it is. So this will help us a lot. And so we can put this optionally. It will, will help us a bit. And you can say that you don't know that this direction vector is actually a vector two. What is a vector two? Vector two is basically just a vector in 2D space. It's not a 3D vector, it doesn't have three uh, parameters, but instead it only has two. So this direction vector will now determine the coordinates in which you will actually have the plane. So you have this plane, and then there's a tail, I think. I have another drawing too. Okay, yeah, should be fine. Okay, right. So this is your plane. If your mouse is actually here, you want to actually get the vector. So this is. This is in vector space. This is the x and this is the y. Y is y pointing downwards. So in every image in 2D space, y, positive y is downwards, whereas positive x is still rightwards. Why is it positive y downwards? It's because in HTML or perhaps in JavaScript, you notice that when you visit a web page, you scroll down from top to bottom. So if I were to define my y to be y0 and it goes upwards, then every single time you scroll a web page, you'll actually be going from bottom to up. But we don't want that on the top to bottom. So they, in web pages, they'll define the 0, 0 to be the top left part. And so they have to define the top left of the viewport to be 0, 0. And anything going downwards is y positive. So we want the, so let me get rid of this. So we want the direction vector from which the airplane will actually follow this mouse. But we get this vector, there will be too much of a magnitude. You know, this, is a, this is too high. So if I would say that my mouse is here, then I will go faster. That's not correct. So instead, we want to normalize the vector, make it magnitude of 1, such that we will multiply it, we will multiply it by whatever speed we have. So we have to get this vector, but normalize it. So luckily, you don't have to do any uh, vector maps and do Pythagoras theorem and divide by the magnitude. You can just do what the Godot engine will help you do. So the first thing you want to do is actually get that vector to the mouse. And to do that, you will take the position of this mouse minus the position of this uh, node. And this node is basically where your character position is. So to do that, we actually want to write the direction vector is equals to the get mouse position. That global mouse position. Now, global mouse position versus local mouse position. Make sure it's a global one. Okay, I'm going to make this clear. Uh, always use the global coordinates. They will save you a lot of trouble. And yeah, so in this tutorial, I'm just going to use the uh, global coordinates. And now I'm going to minus my own coordinates. So what is that? Well, in Godo, you can just get the global position. All right, so we got a direction vector. Now we just need to normalize it. So we take this whole thing, which is going to give us a vector 2. We bracket it and just have it manually. And then we say dot normalize. Okay, let's spell it again. And we end it. All right. So that it will give us the normal vector to the mouse. And now, now that we have a direction vector, the direction unit vector, we will just have to get the total speed that we want to actually travel in. So now that we have the, uh, we'll cut it off at 1, 1. So this is the direction vector. It will be of uh, magnitude 1. And now we'll just multiply it by the speed that we want. So notice in the game that the demo I show you, the airplane is moving at a constant speed. Let's define that constant speed. In 2D development, you will get that speed to be in the units of pixels per second. So let's define a speed. Another one of our class variables. Variable, oh wait, sorry, const. Let's have a constant. And this will be a SPD ED. It will be a float, type float. And let's just give it a value right now. And that will be 100.0. All right, so this is going to be the uh, speed of 100 pixels per second which is actually really small, right? And now that we have this unit direction vector, 
we will take it and we will have the velocity be equals to this direction vector multiplied by the speed. Right? And then afterwards, we will move and slide. So uh, type it out, please. Okay, this one. Um, move and slide. So let me explain what's going on here. Velocity, notice that this velocity was never defined by you. Is in fact a property of this node character body to the which you're now renamed as player. So this specific property will help you. It's one of those properties that they will um, you know, mess around in the back end and you will actually see what's happening to it. And what's one of the things that is happening to it is the move and slide function. So you notice that when you say move, there's also move and collide. But in this case, you want move and slide. So what move and slide does, you can actually, okay, here's the pro tip, you can actually control and you can click. And it will bring up the entire documentation of it. You can read it on your own, on, on your own free time, but in the gist of it is that this move and slide will allow you to take this velocity and move it based on the vector. It will actually move it in the frame. Now, some of you will be like, this is cheating. It's like three lines and I can make the entire thing move. Well, later we can, we, I'll show you another node that doesn't have all these functionalities and you have to pull it up yourself. So this is, uh, so this is the, all the code that is needed to actually make the object move. We'll do the demo uh, like to actually show how it's like in a few seconds. But one thing you notice is that your character or your player doesn't actually have any visuals that's invisible right now. It doesn't have a characteristic. In fact, it doesn't even know what it is, what kind of shape it takes. So in order to make it, you know, um, make it meta, meta sorry, make it real, we have to give it a shape. So first of all, you want to give it its looks. And the first thing you want to do is to add a, to add a sprite. I think it's loading. Is it loading? I think. All right, never mind. Just add a node. Add a child node. You can bring up the menu. And what you want to do, do now is pop the sprite. Now it's not a drink. It, in game development, a sprite is basically just any image to represent a pixel or a 2D character. So a sprite is an image. Now, where do you find this image? Well, luckily for you, where you've downloaded the entire project repository, and I have included the sprite just for you. So if you notice, you go down here. This is the entire project directory. Hopefully, you've opened it up correctly, and you didn't open up like your own pictures. And you'll find underneath that I've organized it really nicely. So one of our assets is, or most of our assets in this game will actually come from the Kenny uh, pro uh, project, which is this you know, free assets art store. So I have to give credit to that. You can find the URL to that person, that lovely person, in the text file over there. So if you'd like to give us, take a look at more of their assets, you can, and they're all for free. So the first thing we want to do is actually look at the ships folder under the art. So if you take a look at, Okay. Yeah, so you take a look at the uh, assets that I have. You want to open up the assets folder. Underneath it is art. And under art, there is the Kenny folder. And inside the Kenny folder, there are a bunch of stuff, like all this stuff. But you want to actually get rid of the powers first. And you want to open up the ships. Now, under the ships, we will choose the easiest one, which is 000, which is the school one, to make us, you know, have the look of the good guy. So we go to the inspector and you have our hover uh, based on the sprite 2D. So in this aspect, you are now designing the game. Now you have to make sure that you're clicking on the sprite 2D instead of the character node. And in this sprite 2D, you will actually just drag and drop your icon over here. All right? Everyone got it now? So you can actually, uh, instead of like, you know, dragging you hold spacebar and you can actually just move around. So now you have this very, very small thing. You will want to define its own um its own uh, shape as well. 
So one thing you notice is this yellow bugging thing right there. This is complaining that this character node does not have a shape. So it does not know what its bounds are. In order to give it its shape, we will add another child node and we'll call it, and this one will actually be of type collision body 2D. This collision body 2D is not the collision polygon 2D, it's a function shape, gives you a fixed shape. And in this collision body 2D, you can define its own shape. So much like what we did just now when we drag and, drag and drop, we're actually providing that asset, that PNG file, into that node. So similarly here, we don't have a PNG file, but we can use one of those that they give us. Not a PNG file per se, but more like a preset. So when you open up the folder over here, notice that you're asking for what kind of shape it has. And you want to put the rectangle shape to the actually sorry, wrong one over here, wrong. Not a rectangle, the circle. The circle shape, right? This circular. And you know, when you are playing games, you sometimes might complain about wacky hitboxes. And in this case, I'm gonna be very generous. I'm gonna not make those two wings at the side be part of the hitbox. So that, you know, if it's all like you know, grazes the wing, you won't die. So, so this will be the shape. You can actually increase the shape of the uh, circle if you do this, but let's just keep it as the normal one, the default one. All right, uh, make sure that that's this. So now we have the shape, everything's fine, there's no complaints. So what else are we missing? Well, we can actually just test out our game right now. So. You want to save your game, uh, save your scene. So Control S, or you can just uh, Command S if you're using Mac, and save that file in. Yeah, I need to see this. I can see. <laughs> save it under Scenes, Player, and save it in this empty folder. All right. So it's Player Scenes. Save it, and what you notice in your own uh, file directory is that if you actually uh, remove all the assets. In the scenes folder, your in the scene folder, your player comes with both a player.tscn as well as a player script. Where's my player script? Ah, player db. Okay, so what you notice is that the player script is actually outside of the uh, player scenes. So you want to keep them together. So please drag and drop the player.gd into the player. So now there are two of them. Like you know, player G and player Got it? Okay, so now we can actually play. Now instead of playing by pressing this button, you actually want to press this one. Now this one comes with the clipper, the these clippers. So this clipper is actually to play the scene specifically. If you play if you press the play button up here, you're actually gonna play the whole game. But we have not defined what how the game is gonna run. Instead, we just want to test this specific scene now. It comes with the script and it comes with all the loops that you have. So let's press this. And notice that it is actually flying towards your mouse. You did it. Okay, so you have made something. Uh, why, one thing you notice is that you know in real life, aeronautics don't work the way whereby your plane can stay stationary like a dragonfly. So what we have to do is, you know, do that in another time, but we don't have enough time to do that. One thing, one other thing you notice is that the plane is actually facing the direction of your mouse. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, let's get rid of the game. So we press the uh, stop button over here, and we can stop the game. Next, we want to actually make the sprite, or more like the character, actually rotate in a way that actually faces our mouse. Now, luckily, you don't have to do vector maps for this. You don't have to like rotate it and calculate the vector between your mouse and that anymore. You can just simply, yeah. Okay, um, okay, thanks. All right, so one thing we need to do as well is actually make it the thing look at it. Now, very simple, it's a one liner. And that, I'm screwing up, okay, that would be simply called the Look at. Yeah. Okay, so look at and it's going to set a point, a vector 2. And what point are you going to look at? Anyone want to tell me? What point are you going to look at? The mouse, right? So, how do you get the mouse position? Yes, get global mouse position. So, just type get global mouse position 
And if you like uh, Demeter, you can also assign it to a variable. So literally, that's simply it. But what you notice is that when you control S or you know, say when you play that scene again, what you notice is that the plane is really, really weird. So what, what's going on? You know, my plane is flying time. Well, it's simply because the Godo is actually recognizing the, the rotation of zero degrees to be on facing right. Whereas our sprite is actually top position facing up. So what you notice is that Sensing. So go back to your main scene, the one that we created at the start. This is guy who's looking pretty empty. Now we're going to add the map scene inside the main scene. Okay, to do that, you want to right click and instantiate child scene. But for me, I like to be cool, so I like to control shift A and add the scene. So what you notice is that a window pops up. This window shows every single scene that you made. 
So simply just type map and you'll get the map scene. And I've added it together. Nice. So now this map scene is a child of my main scene. You know who else is also a child of the main scene? The, the, what else? Here, Mike, where should we add the player? As a child of the map, as a child main, which one, A or B? A? Main, yeah. Add it as a child of main, why? Because if you add it as a child of the map, it's going to inherit its transforms. In other words, if I, let me just demonstrate real quick, don't look If I added the player like this, and I shifted the map, oops, if I shifted the map, the map, the player will actually move to the map. So that's not really what we want. Instead, we want the player to be able to move independently of the map. So we add it as a child of the main. You can either drag it out, or you can just control shift A, and add the player scene as well. So now we have the player and we have the scene. So now let's add the, okay, oops, I really need to do that. There we go, put that up. Yeah. All right, so now we can actually play a game. Okay, so to actually press this play, bo play button, we need to actually define what our project is gonna run. You don't actually know what main is, they just know that it's called main, but we have to say, say specifically, and when you press the play button, the main scene is going to be your entry point, the first node to run. Okay, right. Yes, here. Okay, so we bring up the project settings. This will contain everything about your project, including the window size, the amount of connections it has, what kind of inputs it's going to take. So you want to add here, under run, which is literally just the second tab, the main scene. So we just select the main scene. And select under scenes, under scenes, where's my name? Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah so, it's going to be above. Yeah, it's right here. Uh, I'm going to shift it back to the scene. So please do that as well. So make sure that your scenes, your, your main dot scene, dot PSCN, is under the scenes dot folder, scene folder. Okay, so that's the hierarchy. Uh, then go to project settings. And select the main.dscn from the scenes folder. So main.dscn, okay. So press close, and now we can press it. And what you should get is window pops up, and you can actually fly around the Around it. But why you notice what is different from our demo is that this is a very macro scale. Right? It's like we're playing an RPS game. So instead, we don't want that. We want to make the camera follow the player. Now, a very easy way to do that would be actually to just literally add the camera under the player such that it inherits the transforms and it will always follow the player. So under the player scene, control A or you know, just add the scene. Wherever am I? Just control A or add channel node and add a camera to the so you know game engine essential. One of them is the camera. Yeah, and one thing notice that okay, let's play let's press the play button again. So let's auto save everything. Yeah, you got a camera, but it's still too wide. So let's wait. Let's change the camera zoom to actually make it a bit bigger, a bit closer to the yeah. Let's add it to two, change it to two. Make it closer, do closer, and when you play the game again, yay, you can actually play the game. And it looks exactly like how my dad looks like. One thing you also notice is that when you approach the you know the boundaries, you can actually just keep flying, keep flying. So you want to hide that from the player. In fact, we can actually add boundaries, but our scope of today does not cover that. So one thing, yeah, one thing you want to cover is that you want to make the camera stop. At the boundaries. So what are our boundaries? Notice that this entire map, we actually never knew what's the boundaries of the entire scene. So if you look back at your map scene, you don't actually know what this is. But I calculated just nice for you. You can actually see the 
you can actually see the uh, viewport by a little purple rectangle bounding the entire game engine. So uh, by bounding the entire thing. So you know, just keep zooming, keep zooming, there's this purple line. That is the viewport, that is the window size. So when you play the game, a window will pop up and the window will be bound by that little purple line as well as that pink line at the bottom. So you can also, also change it if you want to. You want to make it 1920 by 1080p, you also can do that, but it's actually under here. So under window display in your project settings, so you can go to project settings and under window, you can actually get the size of the thing, but let's not change it. So the size of the window is 1152 by 648. So go back to the player, uh, go to the camera, Notice that there's one of the uh, fields it's called limit. So the limit is where the, the camera will be stopped. The left limit is literally zero. The zero coordinates, you will stop there. So the left coordinate is zero. The top coordinate is also zero. The right coordinate is the right side of your window, which is the biggest side. So I can draw it up for illustration purposes. This entire window that you, it happens when you play the game is 1152 by 6.8 pixels. Very weird number, I don't know why they But here is 0, 0. And here would be x equals to 6.8, y is 0. And here would be you know, 1152 and 6.8. So similarly, on our right, the rightmost coordinate that you can go to, Will be six forty one five two, and the bottom coordinate, the furthest root, uh, you can reach is six forty eight. Okay, so now we've done all that. You can press play again, and notice the camera actually stops. It actually doesn't show you. Well, you can keep flying away actually, but you know, play with that. So yeah, we're done with that. That part. Now let's make things more interesting. Let's give our uh scene some enemies to actually fight. So an enemy scene, very simple, is almost identical to the player scene. But let's make it more interesting. We're gonna make it a different kind of note. So let's make our enemy now. And I want you to create a other note as well again. And this time instead of a character body to be the one whereby you can just say, oh move and slide. Just moves. We make it simpler because a character body, unfortunately, is a bit more taxing. It has more things to calculate. It's uh, the game engine actually takes more priority to calculate those uh, those types of nodes. Instead, we want to actually give it just an area two D. So an area two D is simply just an area. Unlike a character body, it doesn't have those uh, functions to allow it to move and slide, and it doesn't have a velocity. It was not meant for physics. It was not meant for movement. So we create an area 2D, and now we'll call this the enemy. Now notice that this uh, is Pascal case for like classes, and you can directly control S to save that scene. And what you want to save it as will be under enemy scene, the enemy folder. So go under enemy folder and save your enemy.psn. All right, and it will notice that it will complain. So unlike like the character body, it also needs a area to define what it is. And it also needs a sprite. So let's do that first. Let's create a sprite to give the enemy its looks. My goodness, it's not close. Okay, at Chelsea, and give it a sprite. Similarly, give it a collision body as well. Just like we did. And wow, you got no complaint. That's it. So our sprite, same thing. You can you are probably used to it right now. Go to art, go to ships, and we'll take the second one, the red one, and we'll import the red ship over. So there you go. That's the enemy, how it looks like. And similarly, we're gonna give it the same shape, make it fair. We're gonna have the same hurt box as well. And it's gonna be a circle collision just like the previous one. Okay, so now we have the enemy scene. Now it doesn't do anything though. 
So what do we do to make the enemy actually, you know, uh, do stuff and fly around? So one thing you notice is that the enemies in my demo game spawn from the sides. They spawn around this entire rim of the map. And then it started to bombard the player by crossing over like this, and then it cross over like this. And the thing that is common about where they actually spawn and what direction they're actually going in, and they always go in a straight line, is that they will always track the player. They know where the player is, and they will travel directly from the player. From the moment they spawn to the moment they despawn at the end of the map. So this mechanic that we're doing is actually creating a rim around the entire map allowing the enemy to spawn randomly at any point of this along this line and causing it to rotate towards the player's position and flying directly towards it. Okay, so let's create that functionality. The thing that we use to actually create that rim is called a path to be. So our enemy uh, will be left like this for now. So you can control S to save it again, but we'll come back to it later. Let's go back to the map. Okay. okay, go back to the map and we actually need to create a path 2D. So this path will be called the mob spawner. So we add a child node and we call this path 2D. Now this has two of them, one is path 2D and now it's path follow. We will need both of them. So we'll add the path 2D first. And now we do some editing. So we want to create this entire line around the uh, rim of the map. So you can notice that you have this new toolbar up here. This is specifically uh, here for you to design lines. So above, you have the select tool, we have the add points tool, you have the change as line. And what specifically you want is actually to add the uh, points. So notice that these two will actually help you in you know, creating the point right exactly at zero zero. Let's say you accidentally press a bit too far, then you know you want to be a bit annoying. So instead, you want to select these two. It's called the smart, uh, smart snap and the pixel snap. So go zoom in really really close to your origin, and press one point there. That diamond shape shows up, and that's your first point. Now go zoom out and go directly all the way to the right side. Go to the boundary. And look at that pixel really, really hard and press click. And there you go, that's your first line. Okay. Next, you go down. Doesn't matter the direction of the path, but just make sure it's a closed circle. And press the click over here. And you go all the way out and to the left. Click again. And you go all the way up. And I think you can actually just close the line. So yeah, instead of clicking right at where you really clicked at, you can press this button called close curve. All right, close curve right here. Oh, okay. So a close curve, you can just directly add the last. What you notice is that you can actually go over here to the transform way, sorry, to the line. You can press this, this will actually show up the line. And you'll notice the points are all uh, according to where you want it to be. Unfortunately, this is uh, yeah. 1152 and 648. So those two will be the only values you see. 0, 1152, and 648. Any problems? Yeah. Ah, yeah. So uh, hopefully your toolbar shows that the add point is selected to add points. Yep, and there you go, that's your entire circle. Now, what we want to do is we actually you know, pick a random specific point. Luckily for us, you know, we don't have to do any maths to actually I say which of the points do we want to approximate it to. We have a very cool note called under the, you can just add the path to D. And let's rename this path to D to something else. Let's call it the mob spawner. Okay, mob spawner. Mobs usually refer to our enemies. And this mob spawner would have itself a hold on a child node, and it's called path follow 2D. Alright, so this path follow 2D 
can only operate if it's a child of a path 2D. So what this path of a 2D do, does, if you read the documentation, it basically just has a point. It's basically a point, and it follows along this entire path. So it can be any point in this path. Luckily for you, you can actually just call a single simple function and get which fraction of that line that you want. So this will be like you know, 25%, and then this will be like 50%, and then here will be 100%. And zero percent of the entire line. So, uh, this entire mob spawner requires functionality, and right now it's actually just a child of the net scene. We don't want to do that. We want to actually make it a, a separate object so that we you know we can take it out and put it in different scenes. So instead, we want to save this as okay. So right click, make sure you're selected. That you're selecting the mob spawner. You right click and then you say. Save, uh, save branch as scene. All right, so let's see this one, save branch as scene. All right, make sure it's selected and you can press it if my thing is not lagging. Oh, whoops. It's lagging. Yeah, let's try again. Yeah, but basically, just save branch as scene. And a dialog pops up. Basically, now you're going to save it as a C. So here, um, this will be saved under the enemy folder. You know, you probably say I have open, so you just save it under enemy folder. And you save the mod spawner.tsdn under enemy folder. Okay, so now we have mod spawner. Now we can open it as a separate, like, you know, object file. So, in the scenes for the enemy, and we have our mob spawner. So open it up, and this is what it's like. So now you got a husk, you got a rectangle representing the bounds of the, the map. So now we have the map follow to d as well, uh, follow to d. And what we want to actually do is to add a script to it. So add a script. Remember the script button. Yeah, the script button, very small. Yep, right there. And similarly, just add script, mob spawner, and it will come up with the your usual dialog, the ready and the and the process. So the this one is really simple. We also want to add a timer as well to actually tell you tell us how often does a mob spawn. For me, it's three seconds. You can add it like one second and provide yourself like I can't say World War Two again. But you can just add a one timer and set it to three seconds for moderacy. So add chart note. And this will be a very useful note. It's called timer. Okay, timer. Timer is basically just a clock and it's very useful for all types of game development. Now rename this timer to uh, spawn timer. All right. Then go back to the script, which is we have it here. And now we'll learn something called signals. So what you notice is that this timer, we haven't actually said what is this, this dragging. What is its uh, time? So we'll set the time to be three seconds. And what you notice here is two other properties. One shot basically tells it that once this timer reaches its three seconds and it's like three, two, one, it stops. If this is false, it means that it will keep looping. So 3, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1. Other one is auto start, which means that this timer will start the moment this is this node is available in the scene. Alright, so we want to have both on because oh wait, sorry, no. We want to have auto start on, but not one shot. Because one shot means that the only one enemy is going to only going to spawn. So we have auto start. And and now we want to connect something called a signal. So how do we tell this timer is going to finish its count? Well, there's something called signals. And this signal is a bit obscure, but you have to go to this right panel right here and click node. So this panel basically tells you what kind of uh, specific types of signals this node has. So go to the node folder or the panel. And what you notice is that specifically for the timer, there is a timeout signal. This timeout signal will be attached to the script. 
So we luckily we have a script, right? We have a potential script ready and it's ready in this default form. We're going to edit and connect with this default settings. So connect the timer signal to the script. And this function is basically, if you learn JavaScript, it is an event listener. So this event is the timer, timer countdown. And the event listener is this on spawn timer. So the name the way you name event listeners like you know, uh like signal handlers will be with an on, just like how you name boolean with is or anything that has the you know a true or false kind of property. So this function is going to run every three seconds. I like the process. So we want to reduce the load on the uh, processor, the game engine. So we just have this timer function. And you also notice that it comes with this green icon, which is to show that it's a signal handler. Okay, so now we want to replace this path and put what we want to have over here. We have the path follow to be, and we'll rename it as spawn point. So uh, please rename this as spawn point. So yeah. We name the uh spawn the mod, the path follow to the as spawn point. And what we have here now is to actually determine get also get rid of all the, the thing. is to actually you know make the uh thing spawn every three seconds. So the first thing we want to do is to set the spawn point, which is this thing that is going to be the follower of that path, to a random position on that line. Okay, so it's not, not bad. In fact, we, if you don't know what to do, you can actually just look at the spawn point, go back to the inspector panel, and you notice that in this in the 2D, this spawn point is actually at origin right now. It has two specific functions. One is called progress, and another is called progress ratio. Progress is going by pixels, so I can be like, it calculates the entire parameter, and based on the number of pixels, it will determine at which point it is. So if I keep going, keep going, and then it will, it will loop around at a certain number of pixels. I can't see it right now, but let me just zoom out. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it will just keeps uh, going around and around, and based on the number of pixels, they show. You also can put the progress ratio, and this is based on uh float from zero to one. All right. So one thing you want to do is to just control this progress ratio. So if I was to able to get a random number from zero to one, I'll be able to get a random point on this line. Okay. So now that we know that, we can go back to our script, and on the spawn timer timeout we will have to set the progress ratio to a random number between zero to one to get that point. So very easy, spawn point. And here's a new syntax, it's called the dollar sign. Now what is the dollar sign? The dollar sign is the uh, special type of golden uh, syntax symbol to easily get any kind of node that you have. So one, once I type the dollar symbol, it'll show me every single node inside the, siege, the node tree. In this case, we only have the timer and we have the spawn point. If we had more during the scene, we'll be able to see. So, one thing you want to type is the spawn point, which is literally just the half follow to the and dot, and you can get every single one of its properties. And notice that in the inspector project panel, we have the progress ratio property. This progress ratio will be set to a random number between zero to one. Luckily for us, the game engine provides us such a function, and we do not need to reseed all of them. So this will be the rent and oops, rent. And you have a bunch of them, rent f, rent i. Rent i means random integer, but you have to specify like you know, the specific uh, thing. And random integer range, rent from c, all that kind of stuff. Uh, let me get to my zoom. Uh, back to script. Yeah. And what we want to write is actually a random float. Okay, so random float would be rent f. All right, and yeah, hopefully you guys can see. Rand F will be a random float from zero to one. You can actually just control click and actually notice that the documentation says um, random between zero. Nice, so we got it. You can go back by pressing this button or you can, if you have a very cool mouse like mine, then you can press the four. 
if it wants money. Yeah, so I can go back and get the render point. So every three seconds, I'll select a render point. And now that I have a render point, so let's say this point. Now I have to summon a enemy. Now, how do I summon an enemy? So this becomes one of the most important lessons from game development, and that is instant sync. So much like object-oriented programming, you have an, a class. A class is basically a template containing the properties, methods, and all that within that class. Now you want to create an object. An object is a copy of that class. Based on this template, you can create an object that has and inherits all of those properties. And now you can actually you know, man, uh, change the object's properties and it won't affect the actual class. So we want to instant, instance that class. So how do we even get that class in the first place? Well, in Godot, it comes with a bunch of preloading. You know, when you, when you play games, you notice that there's always a loading screen. Why do you always have loading screens? Why does it, why does it take so long? Well, it's because each one of those assets, like PNGs or massive, you know, NMA models or rocks as well, all those requires a lot of memory space, a lot of storage space. And to load it from disk, it takes a while. So what you want to do is actually to get that variable, uh, put that scene, that asset into a variable. And specifically that asset will be called um, the mock to Notice this Pascal case because it's a class. So this mock to spawn is actually of type type scene. What is a pack scene? A pack scene is basically just an asset, a scene, but it's now packed into like an asset, a file. And this will actually be a preload. So type preload of, I know you can't see the red in the bubble, but that's preloaded as the enemy.tscn. That we you know created this one. Oops. And then we got the SCN. Right. Yeah. So this is the, the way, <laughs> assuming that you know you save the enemy scene in the right place. This will be how it's like. So now this mock to spawn, right? It's going to create the it's going to hold the class, the template for which you create your um, the mock to spawn. So now instead we will create the object. So this variable will be called mock to spawn, but this time in load in the snake case. And it will be that class mock to spawn, but instead we're gonna instantiate it. And don't have anything. Yep. So now this mock to spawn, this one in lowercase, is going to contain the object, a copy of the class. So this mock to spawn will contain all the basic properties, including its transform. So it's going to spawn at zero zero. So that's the problem because our our in our class our enemy is again at zero zero. Just like you know you see over here, it's at zero zero. So and you also notice that this thing needs to be rotated. We'll do that later. So one thing we need to do is to set it right at the so this object now contains all the properties, including global transform, rotation, scale, all that. So you can manipulate it as much as you want now. So mock to spawn, we want to set it to our current position. Mock to spawn dot global position. Now this one it won't come. It won't help you because there's no other company it doesn't know what is mock to spawn. It doesn't know if it's a class. It doesn't know if it's like a certain kind of object. So this mock to spawn this global position will now be at the spawn point. So we do the dollar sign again to quickly get the node. Uh, let's go one point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be at the spawn point, and we will get the spawn point's global position. No auto complete to help you here. So you have to you know, trust your spelling. And now that we have this set to the current position, we will need to also edit a bunch of other stuff, such as the rotation. So notice that just like just now. Hold on, let me take a look at the time. Spawn, position. Yeah. And we need to make it make sure that this uh enemy is going to fly towards the player. So this player will be here. And we're 
gonna be like buying normally. So we have to get this position of the player. How do we do that? Well, notice that in our scene, our player should always be present. In our map scene, our player will always be a child name, so it'll always be there. And until later, it won't be. Well, but I'll tell you when you will do that. So go back to your script, and now we're going to get the player's you know, position. So to get the player position, say that this variable player, which is to get that um that character body 2D, okay, it's going to be equals to you get parent. Dot get node, and now with the type of string, that string will be the player. So what does this do? So get parent basically means I'm going to get the parent of this node. What node are we on right now? We are on the box spawner node, and this box spawner node is going to be a parent, or it's going to be a child of the main scene. So you notice just now in our main scene. Now, map scene, sorry. Now, map scene, this mock spawner is going to be a child of the map. Now, okay, right. Oops, I was not supposed to. Okay. So, now this mock spawner is going to be a child of the map. So, I'm going to get the parent and I'm going to get a node called player. Now, I need to make an apology. Uh, just now, I said the player should not be a child of the map. It should be a child of the map. It should not be a child of the main. So it should be a child of the map. So what you should actually see is that when you go to the main, uh, this player is not supposed to be here. Uh, can you delete that? So delete this player. Go back to the main, uh, to go back to the map, and add the player in under this map. So why did I say start from me just now? Well, it's actually because uh, I thought that the player was not supposed to share its transform in the map, but actually, theoretically, it can. If the entire map moves, like the whole world moves, then the player would move with it. So it should be a child of the map. All right, so now we have these two um, nodes, and this is how your scene tree will look like. There'll be main, there'll be the map, and under that map will be the actual map with a bunch of players. And under that map, we will have the mob spawner and the player. So what is happening when I say get parent dot get node is that since this script right, which is running this um this script is gonna run the uh search for the player. This is going to say get parent, which is, and then once it gets a map, and then it's going to say find a node, which is get node, and we're going to find a node that has called is called player with a capital P. So once we get that node, then we'll be able to store it inside the variable player, and within the player, uh, sorry, there's a question, uh, should we? Yeah, the question here. Yeah. yeah. So um, we we'll get the node and we we'll get the player. Okay, notice that later on the player can die. In other words, this player might not be found because this player will be removed from the scene. So we have to do a safe check to prevent things from uh, not working out later. And it's to say if player. So if you are uh, familiar with Python, this just checks if the player is not empty. So if player, if, if it exists, then you will actually want to make the mob to spawn. On, we'll make it look at the, and we can get parent again. We'll make it look at the player. So you could store it inside the uh, player variable. Oh, where am I? Oh, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So we'll make it stare at the player. So player dot um, global. Position. 
And this is this thing just appeared when Zoom crashed. So what is complaining right about right now is uh the closing right Okay, so we got it. So if the player exists and another person is alive, then you will look at the player. And then afterwards you will actually uh, do the functionalities to make the enemy move towards that player. Alright, so now we cancel and or we go back here. And we will have to actually make that object be put inside the scene tree. So this mock spawner right, right here is just under the scene. But now we're going to add an enemy over here. To do this, we have to call the function add child. So you want to add the enemy and a bunch of them. So you know, it can be like enemy 001, enemy 002, enemy 00, blah, blah, blah. It can be like enemy 9,000. Yeah, so to do that, it will be the add child. So, add the child, and this child will be the mock to spawn. Okay, you that. So this is the entire mock uh, spawner um, logic. Okay, in fact, test it out right now, and we'll go hunting for some enemies who are currently not moving at all. So if I'm lucky, I'll be able to oops, crash. <laughs> Got the walk to spawn. Uh go position. Let's go around. Four C short. Oh it's system function because I actually tap it. Oops. Um yep, I'm so not it's not a function, sorry it's a problem. Yep, okay. Address and let's replay. Okay, so notice that enemies will not despawn. So here is one enemy, yay, it's here. And who else? Who else is going to show up? Let's slowly fly over and see which other person will show up in our sense. So we did it. We managed to spawn an enemy that spawns on the rim. See another one, another one. Now we just need to make it you know, move towards us. Oops. Okay, so we can cancel the game. Stop the game. And now we make it look at us. We had to make make we made it look at us already. But another thing that we did just now was that our enemy was facing the wrong direction, just like us. So go back to your enemy scene and make this sprite transform 90 degrees. Okay, so got it? 90 degrees facing the right direction. So now that we've done that, it should be facing us. So very simple now. Let's do some vector maths, make it move towards us. But what you notice is that this is an area to d It's not a character body anymore. So go back to your enemy, and now we'll actually add the enemy functionality. And that would be to move towards us. So add a script. Can okay, you remember this, this button over here? Add a script. And create it here. And in this script, we will do something to make it move every frame. So unlike move and slide and velocity just now, we have to determine what is, how, how it's going to move. So this will run every frame. So call the function get a physics process. So unlike the process function, this is a physics process. This physics process runs every frame and it will uh, basically run every 60, uh, 60 times per second. Notice that it also comes with this delta property that you saw just now, but we didn't use. Now we're going to use it. Now I can explain to you what delta means, but it will show up a lot in every single game engine you use. You might use Unity later or Unreal. This delta variable will show up. So to make this area 2D move every frame, we do what we do just now. But instead of you know, just like getting a normal variable, and you know, normalize a direction variable, a uh, vector, we will need to just, you know, it's already facing the right direction. We just make it move forward in the direction that it's facing. So to do that, we already have the rotation of the, of the uh, enemy. And now we will have to 
make it move, uh, make its global position, global position, we will set its global position to be that vector, that direction that it's facing, and multiply it by the speed. So like just now, we will have uh, another variable here called const, and it'll be in speed again. This speed is uh, flipped. It's going to be a hundred units, just like us. We're going to apply the same speed as us. And now we have this global position be set to, let's say it's at zero, zero here. So if it's at zero, zero here, we'll want to make it move at hundred units facing towards this direction. So let's say this is like 45 degrees. In other words, this is like 90, so this is like 135 degrees. We have to get this vector and then multiply it by 100. So luckily for us, we can just use this function uh, that I kind of designed for you. And that will actually be taking the right vector and we'll have to rotate it by that direction that is facing. Notice that this rotation that we have, right, is in degrees, 135 degrees, but rather in our calculations, we have to use radians. So to do that, I will have to take this vector that is facing right, in other words, one zero, and I'm going to rotate it 135 degrees. To do that, go over here and say this, this is equals to vector two. Now, why am I calling this? Because this will actually contain a bunch of enums or more like uh, constants for you to use. Vector two dot right is one zero. It has left, there's up, and there's down. And we'll have to use this vector dot right. And it's going to be one zero, basically. And now we're going to rotate it. So instead of rotating it, we, there's this function called rotated. This is the function we'll be using. Rotated just makes sure that this uh, variable will be rotated by the amount of degrees. We, since we already set the uh, airplane to face us, the enemy to face us. So if it was spawn here, it would face 45 degrees if you are standing at the center. So this would be a certain amount of degrees, uh, pi over four radians. But to do that, we just get the rotation. Now, uh, rotation degrees and then rotation, uh, yeah. And this rotation will give us radians. There we go. Yep. Now we can test it out here. Let's play. And we'll fly to the center. And we'll notice a bunch of people should fly in our direction. You know, it's not working. Oops. Did I say that's it. Oh, yeah, I heard. So it's B. Plus equals global position. So, yeah, sorry, I said wrong. A global position should not be set, it should be added. So, every single time, every single frame will add its speed by its current uh, position. Okay. So, uh, also notice I forgot two other things. That is the speed. So, this rotated will give us. One zero rotated, and it's still a unit vector. So we have to multiply it by speed. And so now I'm going to play, I'm going to show you something quite funny. It's going to be really, really fast. I might not be able to catch it. <laughs> so this is like squatting mosquitoes. So why, why is this different? Just now, what we did was that we just multiplied by the speed. In our player script, we multiply by the speed and you know that's what we needed to do. But now I multiply by the speed, which is still hundred times the unit vector, and now it's flying like, like as if we are in the space age. So instead, what this what is going on right now, right, is that the character body is currently like that. The character body is going to help you calculate lag. So in games it lags, right? There's ping, there's different types of frames. Sometimes your processor is not fast enough to make like the calculate the 60 frames per second. In that sense, right, let's say it's running at 30 frames per second. The game process, the physics process, is only able to run 30 times per second. So does that mean that we play five slower? So if I'm only able to run this physics process 30 times per frame versus 60 times per frame, are we moving at half the speed? So in other words, there's a difference between how someone plays on a i9 Intel processors versus a i5 Intel processor. So that's unfair. So what this does, right? What the game engine does to actually compensate for this lag is something called delta, and that is that 
the parameter that you get uh, at the start. So we had to multiply by delta y. Well, delta is the time it takes between two frames. In a healthy processor that runs 60 frames per second, that time, that duration, will be 1 over 60 of a second. But on an unhealthy processor that has 30 FPS or maybe 10 FPS, you know, you know, that's really crappy, then that will actually be 1 over 10, 0 0.1 of a second. And that takes a really long time. So what it's doing right, is actually compensating. If I'm lagging at 30, 10 frames per second, my airplane will actually move 10 times, or just six, no, six times more than the other guy. Sorry, not six times. Unless it's failing. But basically, it will move much more than the other guy that is running at 60 frames per second. And when you look at the results, right, it will be the same because I compensated for the amount of frames that I lost. So that is why we need L to add delta at the end. Okay. And what you notice is that when you play the game now, and I wait for a guy to spawn, fly in my direction somewhere or something. Ah, and yes, you can fly together side by side at the same speed. How wonderful. Great crash. Yeah. Okay. So very beautiful, but there's not enough chaos going on in this map. There's no health, there's no way to die. And this is what I'm going to spend the 30 minutes, the last 30 minutes doing. And that is the combat system, the health. So, very simple. In every game, you have to define your own health. So, uh, we also need a way to deplete each other's health. So, for our enemy, we will have to define a health variable. And this health will be a float. And we'll give this enemy much lesser health, so as it's more fun for us. And we're going to cheat, and we're going to give our own player 200 health. So go here, player, variable, uh, health. So you can type HP if you want to. Uh, I guess health, and it's going to be a flip. It's going to be 200. Okay. So, uh, to recap, enemy is 60, we have 200. Okay, so, enemy, 60, we 200. Now, another thing right, I would just like to add real quick is that you can add something called add export. So, what is add? Add is a annotation, just like in Java. An annotation specifically says to call the editor to do specific things uh, they would do on runtime. So this add export, right, will actually just make this variable health be doable in the inspector. So what you notice right now, right, in the health in the enemy, you notice that this thing came out in the inspector. Very cool. And I can change it. And I can press reset to change it back to 60. So this is just a useful tool for you to quickly edit. So let's say you don't want to go into the script, you don't want to change the 60 to like 100, you can just easily do it from the inspector. So it's called add export. And you can do a similar thing to the player as well. You can add export help. Okay. So now we have to create ways to actually deplete that bullet and decrease that health. Now I have to talk about physics bodies. So we go back to our uh, 2D scene, and you know this uh, circle would you know, determine the way that we get hit. This enemy is basically just a floating hub box. Yeah, this enemy is basically just a floating hub box. In fact, let's make it a bit easier for us. Let's make this slightly wider. Okay. Uh, 10. And this one is. Okay. This one is. Oh shit, 16. Let's set this to 16. You know, just to make our lives a bit easier. The enemy is easier to hit. So this enemy is a floating hub box. You just hit it and then you'll die. So every single time this enemy's hub box gets invaded by something, it should take damage. If it gets invaded by a bullet that I'm shooting, it should actually take damage. So now we're going to go to the node and we're going to add a signal. So like just now we had timers, right? Timers had signals to tell us when the timer runs out. This one also has very useful signals for us. That is the area and the signal. 
this area enter signal will run every single time our area collides with another area. Okay, so uh, say area enter double click and connect it to the enemy screen. Okay, so at the bottom, you'll see that this is the script. So this means that I get hurt. All right, so let's do the get hurt function. Let's be a bit neater. And yeah, um, here it is. Let's create a function called receive damage. So we'll do the same thing for our data uh, later. So receive damage, and now we have we have to tell how much damage we're gonna do. All right. So we have a function up here which we will define called receive damage. So to get rid of the thing, and this will tell us how much damage we are, and we are expecting a float. Okay. Yep, and it will be a void. Doesn't do anything. Yeah, just an annotation. And this receive damage will take down our health by this amount of damage. Okay, very simple. And next, after we receive a certain amount of damage, we'll die. So if our health is less than or equal to zero, then we have to die. So what is die? They won't define it for us. So what is die? Die is a function as well. It's a void function. The void function. And to remove yourself from the scene, literally just cross this out. To do that, it's a very simple function called kill free. Okay, so what's kill free mean? Means that I'm gonna kill myself, like do you know kill, not the kill. So kill like give me up. And you're gonna queue up to go to heaven. So this kill free is gonna allow the nodes to send a signal to the game engine to say, hey. I'm gonna delete myself. I'm gonna free myself from memory. Because luckily we this unfortunately Godot is made in C, so that means that it's gonna be a memory on the same. You have to tell the game engine uh when to remove myself from memory and not to cram out the entire RAM. That is also being crammed out by Chrome running 16 different tabs at once. So to do that, you just kill free. And you know, then you can remove yourself from the uh, scene. So that is the receive damage, but we have not told how much damage we're gonna receive. So where is our damage? How much? How do we know how much damage is being dealt? Well, we will have to define it within the area itself. So what is entering this body, right? So let me draw another one, and this one will be removable. So similar for me, both the player and the and the airplane as well, is that we have a hub box. And there'll be a bullet that will be in this shape. And it'll be it will have a hitbox. So we make this um distinction between hitboxes and hitboxes. We'll make it clear later on about masks and layers. So this hitbox is gonna enter the hitbox. And when I get entered, uh when this, when this hitbox gets entered, then it will receive a damage that is specified by this hitbox and this area. So what you notice is that in the signal that you see here, it has a parameter already written for you, and that's called the area. So what this area is, right, is it's going to be a node, and this node itself is going to contain a property called damage. So we're just going to add here area, which is specifically referring to the argument or the parameter right here, and we're just going to say damage. Okay, wait, sorry, damage to Deal because I'll make it clearer. Okay, so this variable has not been defined by us yet, but we will define it later. Next, this area is going to be Q3. Why do we want to do that? Because if not, the bullets will be passing through us, and then you know each bullet that we should be able to take down like two, three planes at once, which is a bit unfair. So we want to make this bullet disappear after it hits us. And 
we have six. We'll have to do the same thing for the player as well. So before we design our bullet, uh, let's go back to the player scene. Uh, the player script, sorry. The player script over here. I'll do the same thing. And we're going to do the exact same thing. So unlike the enemy, right, which is itself a floating hurt box, this collision tree is actually not the hurt box. So this makes things a bit more complicated. In fact, I can actually show you by actually going to the node. And you notice that there's actually no area in the signal. So what we had to define, right, is actually an own area that has the same shape as us. So you might be asking why then, what was this collision shape is? It's actually to interact with the environment, the world. So if I was to bring a, you know, a dungeon and it has boundaries, this collision shape will actually collide with the actual boundaries. So in other words, this boundary doesn't do anything in our game because we haven't decided design any boundaries. Instead, we have to design a hurt box for the player. So let's add a node. It just will be area 2D. And each area 2D comes with its own collision shape 2D. Okay, so this area 2D, we rename it as hurt box. And this collision shape, we have to give it its shape. So L here, add a sphere. Circle. And it's gonna over, it's gonna be the exact same shape as the other one. Okay, so yeah, this is the hub box. And now we have since we have a hub box, we have the signals. So the signal will be area ended. Double click, connect. And then going back to the player script, you have this method. You're unable to follow. Okay, so now that we have this. We will have to do the exact same thing that we did for the enemy. So if you are lazy, you're feeling a little lazy, you can actually just do this, copy, go back to the player script and paste. And also add in that. Okay, so now similarly, we have to define the receive and die functions as well. Because the enemy and the player are so alike. So go back to your die function in the enemy screen. The die and receive damage functions. Copy this, go back here, paste it up right here. Right. Yep, and it should be okay. Okay, so it should be done for both the player and the enemy. Now we have to uh, design the hitbox. So now we only design hitboxes, now we have to design the hitbox. And this will be where our damage to deal variable comes in. So we have to create a new scene and we call this, this. Let me go and find my scenes just in case the other things wrong. Okay, call it bullet dot D. So create this scene, press the plus button, go back into the uh nothing here. And now this uh will be an area 2D as well. Because it's uh, just a floating hit box. So go to the other node, go to area 2D, select it, rename it, bullet. Bullet, bullet. Okay. Add a node, control A, add a collision body, just like you know, uh muscle memory for getting the so the inspector as shape. And this will be a circle for now. And notice that we also make it invisible. So now we have to give it a sprite. So go over here, add, add, sprite. And luckily for us, we have the projector. So uh, in the assets, go to art, go to Kenny. And notice that there will be some tiles for you to use. Amongst these tiles will be tile 0001. Zero, 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 and that is the PNG for the bullets. Okay, and much like our problem with the rotation, we also have to change the transform and make this sprite 90 degrees. Do not make the node, the area 2D 90 degrees, make the sprite 90 degrees. Okay, so we, yeah. Uh, time or uh, time uh, the type of the uh, note 
Yeah. Area 2D. Yeah. So click other node, area 2D, rename it, triple alert, add a coordinate shape, add a circle, add a sprite. Okay, you're done. Okay, so this is a head box. Okay, and here comes the interesting part. And now I have to talk about layers and masks. So notice in every single area 2D, we have this new physics body. This new Okay, but basically it's a collection of objects only. And inside it comes with layer and masks. So in order to for us to actually tell like what is a friendly bullet versus a enemy bullet, we had to come up with layers and masks. So if I was to spawn a bullet, because I'm also someone who can shoot bullets, right? And I was to spawn one bullet right here in front of me, would that bullet hurt me? Would I kill myself? So that is the idea of layers and masks to make sure that two bullets, right, which come from different sources, can be on two different teams and will not actually hurt one another. So this will be all user defined. And over here, it comes with bits and some bits here. So notice that each one of them are just there, 0, 1, and 2. This is all are binary. Let's click these three dots over here. And oops, I already defined it for you. You see player, enemy, and world, and, and yeah, world. You guys see that? Okay, good. So I don't have to rename it for you. So yeah, I have rename it for you guys already. These three are representing the different types of uh masks and layers that exist. One is for world, two is for player, three is for enemy. In other words, uh when it comes to masks and layers, a layer, the difference between a layer and a mask, right, is that a layer is something that exists. Whereas mask is something that senses. All right. So in order to understand that better, you always have to say that mask is something that senses things. Only a mask can sense a layer. A mask cannot sense another mask. And a layer cannot sense anything. In other words, this hitbox is coming from the enemy. This bullet is supposed to hit me, the player. So in other words, it will exist on the player um, layer, so the player layer number two. Okay, this is all of it. One, two, one, two, three, right? Three is enemy, two is player. So if I go here, how about here, it's player. So this bullet will exist on layer two. Okay, I, the player, am sensing for any hitboxes that enter my hitbox. In other words, I am masking for anything that exists in layer 2. So my mask is in layer 2. Okay. Now, if I have to shoot a bullet in the other way, if I have to shoot a bullet, this bullet is going to aim for an enemy thing like this. I forgot how to Okay. And this is searching for hitboxes that come that hurt the enemy, I will be masking for anything that exists on layer 3. And this bullet that I shoot up will be existing on layer 3. In other words, when I spawn this layer 3 object, it will not interact with my mask because my mask is only sensing for things that exist in layer 2. Okay, so this is how we are you know, designing the, the physics of it. So now that we have that settled, this bullet will actually be shared between both the enemy and the player. Both of them can shoot the bullet, but who determines? Uh, the shooter will determine what team it's on, whether or not it is in layer two or layer three. Okay, so we have to leave this empty for now. We go back to the player. We take look at his, take a look at his hurt box. Sorry. Okay, so we have to leave this as empty for now. Okay, so cancel both the layer one and last one from the bullet and control S to save this bullet to see. We save it under projectiles. So go to scenes and go to the projectile and save it as a bullet of PSEA. Okay, so now we have that. Right, one. Uh, so now we have that. Um, so now we have to determine 
how we get hurt. Our hurt box here, currently by default, is going to be a layer one and a mask one. Like we drew out over there, our hurt box for the player will mask for anything that wants to hurt us on layer two. So our mask is layer two. Okay, got it. Now we'll go back to the enemy. The enemy itself is a hurt box. So we go to this collision. Cancel the ones once the stands on the layer. And now we are going to search for anything that exists on layer three, the enemy layer. So in other words, we mask for layer three. Okay. Now it comes the difficult part of shooting bullets. Okay. So now we have to do the bullet part and we also have to do the uh different types of ways that image it can be shot out. So by now you should be used to something the seed instantiation. And similarly to in, to create things to make things spawn, we have to make it a pack scene first, clear uh called class, instantiate the object. So on going back to the uh, player script, we have to say what is a bullet. So the bullet will be a variable bullet. Okay, a variable bullet is going to be a pack scene. You can carry that as well. Pack scene. It's going to be a preload of the bullet scene. Now, do the exact same thing for the enemy. Enemy, go over here, uh, part of the thing up here, variable, bullet, it's going to be like this. Okay, very cool. I'm running out of time, so now um, this bullet will actually be shot up every single time uh, for us. It will be shot up every single time we press the touch button. So, um, Go back to your player uh, scene. And here, now we're going to accept inputs. So the accept inputs, we have to do the player okay. unhandle input. So what this means is that this function, which is called unhandle input, we we'll take in any inputs. So this will read any inputs that we have, ABCDs on the keys, escape button, backspace, and even a mouse click. And luckily for you, I have really a that part out. So if that event that you know that we sent is dot is action press and we say it should look. Shoot bullet close parenthesis. Oops, what did I do? Okay. Oh, damn it. And, uh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, the screen. Well, oh no. Okay. Um, ah. I pressed the wrong button. Okay, I need to close the thing again. <laughs> Oops, uh, alt F. Save. Yeah, the screen is too zoomed in, so I can see how it Okay, gosh. Okay, uh, where am I? Okay, I'm back here. Yeah, okay, so if event is action press shoot bullet, then then you have to call the function shoot bullet, which we have not defined yet, which we will define up here, uh, which is down there. So go back down to the bottom. And say a function, shoot, bullet. 
tell me a y function. And we will now instantiate the thing. So to save a bit of time, you know, I just uh, shift it out. Variable bullets equals to the bullet in capital space, a capital letter, dot instantiate. We go down. The we're gonna make this bullet be part of the scene. So we have put if we get a parent, which is the map. And we get this map and add this child to be B. Let's make it keep going down. Uh, yeah, add the blue. Okay, then next we have to set the bullet's position to be at our position. Bullet dot global position is going to be equals to our global position. Then next we have to make the bullet look at the same direction as us. So bullet uh, basically look at the global mass issue dot look at it doesn't show up but let's trust can we either get mass global mass position next we have to make the bullets collision so here's a bit of binary maps this layer is going to be in terms of binary, this layer, this mask, one, two, three, four, those numbers don't actually count. Anymore. They're actually referring to the masks. So, bullet dot layer. Let's go down. Bullet dot collision layer equals. equals to a number. So let's go back to this layer uh, over here. Notice the enemy and you look down over here. This is the mask of the enemy. In other words, we must create a bullet that exists on layer three. So what you notice is that when you hover over all of these bits, you'll notice they're actually telling you that all these bits are value of something. So what is this? This is value four. So in binary, right, this whole thing is actually refer uh, referring to a binary thing. It is like this. As I said, it's in reverse. Huh? So this is layer four, this is layer three, this is layer two, this is layer one. This, if I want it to be only layer one, then it will be zero, 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 one. All right, zero, 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 one. Then if I want it to be layer two and layer one, it will be 0011. If I want it to be all three, all four layers, it will be 1111. So it's basically just referring to on and off. Similarly, if I want it to be only layer three, then it's going to be 0100. In other words, do you know what this number is in binary? Uh, in the decimal, sorry. Four. So the number we put here is referring to and converted to 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay, which means I'm only going to activate layer 3. Okay, so that's the, the interesting part. And now I'm going to speed run because I'm really out of time, but I'm going to speed run the enemy one. Uh, so this one is the bullet for the shooting of... Yes? Oh, handle input. Uh, yes, up here. So I just got unhandle input. If event, which is the parameter, is action press bullet, shoot bullet, then we will 
the left mouse button. Mm. Okay, I already defined that in project settings, so luckily that. And now we have to go to the enemy scene, I mean, so the player scene, the player, which sorry, the enemy script. And we do something very similar to the enemy. To what we did the player. We will have a variable bullet that is like this. Here we define that, luckily. We, and instead of me pressing the button to actually make it shoot, we have to define a timer. So this one, we have to say, shoot without. So shoot, add a scene, add a node, and call it timer. Then it shoots, yeah, don't worry. We just make it shoot every single three seconds. Okay, so this will be, this will be fun. So this timer, right, call it the shoot, go down. All right, and this will be a timer of one second. Oh, uh, what's my shooter? One second, it will auto start, but and it will keep looping forever. All right, so now we connect the signal much like we did just now. Timeout, connect it back to the script, and on timeout we have to shoot a bullet. So this one, very simple. Also like what we did, uh, shoot bullet. And then we have a shoot bullet function. Up there, up here. I go. Yep. Okay, and then we have a function shoot bullet. I don't care about the organization. So we have a shoot bullet function. Uh, I don't want to I got time for that. Uh, and then we're gonna say variable bullet is equals to bullet instantiate. And then we are going to get parent, same thing, not at child, and the bullet object. We are going to get the bullet's goal position. And here we show me. Equals to the global position, our global position. We will make the bullet's global rotation. It equals to our global rotation. Because you know the enemy is right in the fixed position. And now we will have to make the bullet dot collision layer <coughs> equals to layer two. And that is zero zero one zero. That is two in decimal. So that's two. Okay. Yes. So global rotation. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. And if that's the case, then we have a fully functional one. Yeah, everyone should be good. So I can shoot bullets. It's not rotate up, right? <laughs> okay, I have to add the, the thing later, but let's see how our enemy react. Yeah, they are leaving a bunch of poop on the ground. And now we just have to make the oops, uh, it crashed. <laughs> but now we have to make the bullet move. So we go to the bullet scene. This is going to be fast. I promise. Uh, uh, I'll be uploading the complete game afterwards for you guys to play because I really had so many like things uh, added already. So you guys just need to plug in the stuff and uh, yeah, it'll be really fun. Like for example, the game over screen, that's really easy. And for the bullet, this is what you need to do. So, and I can't control it. Okay, so this is how this one will be done. I will have the damage to deal be 20, so that you know you can actually connect. The speed of the bullet will be 500, five times faster than how I'm flying. It will fly at the same speed as, you know, it's basically like the plane, but now instead the speed is 500. So the motion is just like the plane, the enemy plane. And on lifetime, we will die. So how do we decide the lifetime? We have to have the bullet lifetime. So uh, this one is based on the timer. Uh, it's called lifetime. And we'll have a node that is one shot and shot starts. And this will be 
within within seconds. Be like five seconds. Yeah. Okay. So now we can play and should have a fully functional game. So yeah, yeah, well that's fine. You can get shot by then. And by the time I reach like this, they ask me to shoot by the way. So I can shoot and I can kill them. It's just missing pressure effects. And I die. Okay, so that's the game in a nutshell. I just have to add the game over screen and the kill effects and you will have the demo complete. So um, to officially end the session, I will show a bit more tidbits afterwards, but to officially end the session right now, I like to thank all of you for coming and for your patience with enduring with me for the next uh, past seven minutes as well. And yeah, thanks for making a game with us. Uh, you can, if you like more, know more about game development, you can join uh, Invest GDG. Though I'm retired, I still go over there. So I don't mind if you guys want to join that as well. And yeah, basically have fun in uh, NUS, SOC. Find a club you want to join and learn more about hacker culture as well as to know more about free and open source software. So thank you much for, very much for coming. I hope you enjoy. Okay. Maybe before you continue, yeah. I will show the feedback and stuff. So okay. Go to HDMI hall. Oh yeah, okay. Hold on, before we before you guys leave, um, if you guys have any feedback, this is the QR code for the feedback form. So feel free to leave any feedback for this session. Uh, you notice we have some refreshments going around. You still have some extra. If you want to take some before you leave, uh, these are sponsored by Marshall Way. So if you're interested in their position, feel free to scan there as well. Uh, feedback forms here if you need it. Yeah. And then, yeah, so Marshall Way is sponsoring like the refreshments. There are some open positions, and yeah, this is their kind of open position. If you're interested, just scan the QR code. Cool. Yeah, you want to continue? Yeah. 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 yeah, So, yeah, I'll just show you guys the last couple parts. It's the game over screen, and also the, the depth effect. I want to raise the ball. Plus, I already created the scene for you guys. So, what you guys need to do, right? Just do the same thing over, clear the scene, add the child, and you're done. Okay, the most interesting part is the, the game over screen. So, after you die, go back to the player, player script. After you die, which you call over here, you need to add the game over screen. I have created a game over screen for you guys already, and it looks like this. So if you go over to your um, scenes and along with over here, so go over to the scenes, uh, the, under the UI, it has a green node, the very special green node, and it looks like this. So you like, and I created the animation, the, the audio, all that, and you basically just go over to the player script. Play script, die. You have to instantiate it. So you do this like this is like hundred times doing it already, but <laughs> call it game over uh screen. Preload. It'll be preload um game scene. Close bracket. When you die. So, get yeah, current. Yeah, and the die. Okay. Um, sorry. Get the thing first. So, game over. Screen. Four letter equals to game over screen. And I spelled wrongly, but whatever. Just uh, essentially. Get her. Dot. Uh, what is it? Edge out. And game moves me. Oh, game over. And I forgot to say it's a mirror. 
So let's get hit 20 times or 10 times. You just stay here actually, and it will just keep coming up to you. Yeah. Uh, wrong way. Uh, two, three, nice and three. Okay, yeah, yeah. And you can sound a lot of things. Sadly, this workshop is really, really scale because of the sound. It's not fun. Unfortunately, I'm going to stay here. Which is really sad. That's why you can only hear my dreadful voice that is dying for the past two hours. But yes, uh, that's it. Um, there's also a game over here. No, yeah, thank you. There's also the death effects. Yeah. There's also the death effects. Um, the one, same logic. The set shape, get cast, the set shape, and child. That's yeah, so it looks like this, and this will be the last thing I show you, I promise. Alright, it looks like this. Enemy, sorry, defects. Enemy, yeah, can you look at it? It's like this. So, this is an animated uh, thing, it contains three sprite frames, and then you can just start playing it, and it looks like this. Uh, that's my play button. Okay. Okay. So yeah, just edit and edit the position. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Ah, oh my. Oh, we are not people are not the <laughs> <laughs> I think I was going to give them a break, but I realized you're not going to give them a break. Oh, <laughs> so it's like, okay, I'm just going to pass it around slowly. Okay, good okay. Yeah. Let me stop the Zoom recording. Mm -hmm.